We know what's going to, do we all agree this is going to happen? Do we believe one day there will be a one world government with a one world religion and we will be the enemy? We will be their enemy. And so as we look at that today, and some of us may speculate, for roughly 2,000 years people have speculated it's our generation. Folks, I speculate it's our generation. <laughs> So if you think it's going on, for 2,000 years, people have thought it's going on. I thought about that this week of, you know, when the disciples said, well, when is this going to happen? From Matthew 24, and he said, no one knows but the Father. God the Father in his timeline has a day in real time, in history, in, in the timeline of creation that says, on this day, Jesus is returning, this is going to start unfolding. It is good for us not to know, because if, if, if it said this is going to happen in 2538, wouldn't it, it would make the church maybe, well, that's not for 500 years and we've got time. It really, when you look at the history of this, every, many generations said, it's our generation that's the last one. And I think what that does, it gives the church you know, energy and, and, and a goal and the perseverance of the saints to, we've got to keep preaching the gospel because it's soon. I will say this, I've told this to many people most of my life, you don't have forever. Either Christ will return or you will see him, most of us here in this room, within the next 30 to 50 years. Do we all agree with that? Whether, whether he doesn't come back for 500 years, we will be in his presence before then. So I would say you, you are the last generation, because when you die, you, you're the last one of you. You're going to be in heaven with him. Which, won't that be a joy? I'm looking forward to it. I hope you are as well. So he sees the dragon, and on the, then John says in verse 1, I saw a beast coming up out of the sea. Out of the sea, a lot in the Bible, and this is symbolic language, so we're, we're drawing, I don't want to say conclusion, but we're drawing what we think might be going on here. And I think what's going on here, it says that this Antichrist will come out of the sea. There's idioms in Hebrew 2,000 years ago and 4,000 years ago. And the sea was the Gentile nations. And again, this is not definitive. Anyone that says, I know for a fact every image of the book of Revelation means this, they do not know what it means. We have ideas, we can take puzzle pieces of the Bible, we can interpret things, we can think through things. We, we're given this information so that we can think through things and maybe observe things and see things. I do think the Antichrist will come from uh, the nations, though, or from the, from the, from the Gentile nations. Uh, I think one of us here was talking, uh, I don't see right now, but uh, Danny thinks it may be, and I said it could be. I did some research, you did some research on the president of Turkey, Erdogan, I think is his name. He's doing some really odd things and some unusual things. Uh, and people are saying that he may have an aneurysm. He may be dying. And there are elections in Turkey came up in 2023. But he may not be able to run again because of this head problem. And as you're reading through here, it says he'll have a wound in his head and it'll appear dead. But it'll come back alive. And I'm not saying he's it. In World War II, guess what everyone said the Antichrist was? Hitler. In 1980, does anyone remember when Ronald Wilson Reagan was called the Antichrist. And Ronald Wilson Reagan, there's three letters in his first, uh, six letters in his first name, six letters in his middle name, six letters in his last name. And people said, it's Ronald Wilson Reagan's the Antichrist. Because look at his name, 666. And uh, I think Thomas Jefferson, if you look at history, Thomas Jefferson, people said, Thomas Jefferson's the Antichrist. There's a lot of people been accused of that. Stalin, Lenin, Pol Pot. You see a lot of these people that do horrific, demonic inspired actions, and you would say that is certainly demonic and certainly satanic. Interestingly, the Bible says there would be the Antichrist, capital A, and but we also told in the Bible there's many Antichrists that are in the world today. Anyone who says that Jesus is not the Son of God is an Antichrist. Are there a lot of Antichrists in the world today? The point is going to be when that group someday says we want a leader that rejects the things of God. And we want a worldwide leader that rejects the things of God. That's what we're headed towards. Now, we, I hope everyone in this room would say, I will never deny. I will never deny who Christ is. <clears throat> and it says he saw a beast coming up out of the sea, and there's a lot of people that speculate that's the Gentile nations, having ten horns and seven heads, and I'm sure you've all heard this before, that that's the uh, old Roman Empire. If you do a search today on Google and you look up the ancient Roman Empire and you look up the European Union today, other than the north coast of Africa, 
the European Union is almost identically in the area of the ancient Roman Empire. And uh, I do want to flip over. I told you earlier we're going to read in Daniel. If you'll flip over to Daniel chapter 2. If you don't want to, I'll read this. So if you just want to listen along. But in Daniel chapter 2, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastics, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos. Right there in that little bit after Psalms before you get to the end. Daniel chapter 2, verse 31 Daniel has a dream, and I, I tie this stuff, because remember I said a little bit ago, we're going to take some puzzle pieces that are in the Bible, information God gives us, and try to piece them together. And Daniel 2.31 says, uh, Daniel tells the king Nebuchadnezzar, You, O king, were looking, and behold, there was a single great statue. The statue was large and of extraordinary splendor. It was standing in front of you, and its appearance was awesome. The head of that statue was made of fine gold. The breast and the arms of silver, its belly and its thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You continued looking until a stone was cut out without hands, and it struck the statue on its feet of iron and the clay and crushed them. Then the iron and clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed all at the same time. It became like chaff from the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away so there was not a trace of them was found." But the stone that was struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Now we know from that passage, and some people disagree, but generally the uh, several great kingdoms in the world, if you do your history, some of the great government systems were what the area of Spain and Portugal is today. Uh, Gaul, which is Germany and France today on a map. The Gaul area, Britannica, England, Greece, Judea, Egypt, and Asia Minor. And we are told from this statue in Daniel that it was Babylon was the king, and was, uh, the statue had this gold head was Nebuchadnezzar. And Daniel, if you read the book of Daniel, says, you, O Nebuchadnezzar, are that gold. Your kingdom is that golden head. Interestingly, these metals of this statue, gold is the most valuable, but it's also the most easy to bend or meld or break. As it goes down, the metals get harder, but they get less valuable. And as we go through those uh, kingdoms, it's, and we know from history there was Babylon. Who defeated Babylon? I'm, I'm sorry, it was started with, uh, uh, actually it was Egypt. Who gave Israel their first headaches? Egypt, right? Remember the 400 years of slavery? You had Egypt was conquered by the Assyrians, which is modern day Turkey. Turkey, modern day Turkey, Assyrians took out the northern ten tribes. Then Babylon beat the Assyrians and the Medo-Persians and the statue that had two legs said it had two different elements was the Medo-Persian Empire. And you go through these historical kingdoms and world powers until finally it says here in Daniel, it says there was a stone cut out, not cut out by human hands. Now who's this stone? Who's this cornerstone, do you think, that's going to destroy all the kingdoms of the world and all the kingdoms of the world become his kingdom? Jesus Christ. Now, even though they said that these ancient powers were world powers, they weren't really world powers, were they? Did they rule the Americas? There's going to be a kingdom one day that will be a world power, and Satan always tries to copy what God is doing. Does Satan know that one day Jesus will return to this earth and take dominion and power over this entire world? So as he's taking this kingdom, this world over as his kingdom, guess who's trying to do the same thing? The devil is. He's trying to get a one world government that he runs. And that's what uh, Revelations is telling us about here in chapter 13. Is it says there's this beast that comes out of, and this is the Antichrist, that comes up out of the sea having ten horns. And these are the ten horns or powers and the seven heads and on the horns were diadems or crowns. This is saying government authority. This world power would have human, physical, worldly government authority. And this person, this beast that comes up out of the sea would, have, would be rulers over all of that. Now again, I'm just speculating, and I'm just saying, for example, does that sound like the United Nations? That has all these different sovereign states that all report into the UN. I would encourage you also, I did some looking at Turkey this week. They applied in 1987 to join the UN. In 2004, their application was received. In 2016, they've been put on status of, we're holding on yet because you're not following all of our rules. And unless you follow all of our rules, we won't let you enter this union. And uh, interestingly, some years ago, we had a girl from Portugal that lived with us and a girl from France, and the girl from Portugal was mad they were letting Turkey in. And she said, well, they're all backwards and they're, they're poor and we got to give money to 
support them in the European Union, and the goal is that all these nations have equal wealth. No one's rich, no one's poor, no one has authority. We all cede authority to the European Union. And I'm sitting there 15 years ago thinking, this sounds like Antichrist time. Yeah, you know, we all cede authority. We all need to give up our individual sovereign national authority to this union. And she was mad. They were letting Turkey in. And the girl from France said, I'm mad they let Portugal in because you guys are backwards and uneducated and poor. And <laughs> so it's all relative. And she said, we had to give a bunch of money to get your standard up to European. And it cost us a lot of money. They took a bunch of taxes from us trying to raise your standard of living to where France is because they want one big giant, everyone's equal. I think it was Reagan that said uh, socialism only works in two places. One in hell, where they already have it, and two in heaven, where they don't need it. Everyone is, <laughs> you know, good. But anyway, but going back to chapter 13 in Revelation, it says these ten horns or these ten sovereign powers would yield their authority to this one beast that comes up out of the sea. And the beast which I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were like those of a bear in verse 2. And it goes down through here talking about these uh, empires. And I do want to look now, if you're still in Daniel, I said, hopefully I told you to keep your place there. If you look at Daniel chapter 7, or you can just listen, this is just a few verses, Daniel 7, uh, verse 4. He talks about this, this beast that he sees. So he talks about the statue first. Then Nebuchadnezzar has a dream about a beast. And Daniel tells him the beast in chapter 7 of Daniel verse 4 says, The first was like a lion. It had wings of an eagle, and I kept looking until its wings were plucked, and it was lifted up from the ground, and it made to stand on two feet like a man. A human mind was also given to it. And behold, another beast, a second one, resembling a bear, and it was raised up on one side, and three ribs were in its mouth between its teeth, and it said, Arise and devour much meat. Verse 6, After this I kept looking, behold, another one like a leopard, which was on its back. So it was, uh, and I'll just finish that verse. Had four wings and a bird, and the beast had four heads, and dominion was given to it. And after this I kept looking at the night vision, behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrifying and extremely strong, and it had large iron teeth, and it devoured and crushed and trampled down the remainder with its feet, and it was different from all the other beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Now what did we just read about this beast in Revelation? How many horns does it have? Ten horns. So this Daniel chapter 7, and interestingly, if you look at those later today or take your notes out, if you look at Daniel 7, the order he gives the beasts in versus John the Revelator on the island of Patmos, it's as though there's a scene through history and Daniel's back here and he mentions this one first and then this one and this one and this one. And from John's perspective, which one, looking back, which one does John see? He sees the last one. So if you read those, they're in reverse order. And what I took from that was they're looking at it from their perspective on a timeline. John saw the last kingdom first and then Nebuchadnezzar's last. But he's saying, but there's a fourth kingdom still coming. Daniel predicted a fourth beast that was more terrifying than all the other ones was coming. And then John here says there's a beast coming that's not here yet. And a lot of people do believe, and I'm probably following this camp, I think it is a revival of the ancient Roman Empire with the ten toes that was crushed by the by the uh, stone that was plucked out or carved out without human hands. I just thought it was interesting when I was reading those, I kept looking at the reverse order of them, and I thought it could be a timeline from Daniel's perspective versus from John's perspective, which one they saw first. John's looking backward at the, th the three kingdoms. Daniel was looking forward at all four. You catch up to John, and then John says, still there's a fourth one that's not here yet, it's coming. And again, I would encourage you this afternoon, if you Google that, look at the ancient Roman Empire, which I said a moment ago, and look at the European Union, and it does seem to fit very well. The European Union today and the ancient Roman Empire seem to very, very well fit together in the same geographic area. Some people say, yeah, but there's not 10 kingdoms there. There's 30 now. And it's like, well, over the years, boundary lines have changed and new nations have come in. But it's the regional area. There's those areas there that are the same in the European Union and in the ancient uh, Roman Empire. He said, so one of these heads that had been slain, verse 3, and he had a fatal wound, was healed, and the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast. In verse 4, and they worshiped the dragon. Now, who's the dragon again? The dragon, Satan. You know, right here, and if you, if you look at this in Cedar Hill, Texas, up just a little south of Dallas, 
And I've got some friends over in Leander uh, Independent School District, Dave Sanders and others that I'm working with. They've got on the school board in Leander ISD, Texas, right here in Texas, three women on the school board. And when they go to their meetings, they have their coffee cups. Guess what's on their coffee cups? Wiccans. And they said, we're witches of the light. We're not witches of the dark. We're witches of light. And we want to bring all this stuff into the schools and all this witchcraft. And folks, I know you're, some of you are looking at me like I'm crazy. I encourage you to look at this stuff. This is not in New York <laughs> or the same demonic powers that were 2,000 years ago are in the world today. I am convinced to my core that because America has historically been a Christian nation, that God has protected America to a large degree. As our nation has kicked God out of our nation, guess what's happened to his protection? And a lot of these demonic forces are coming in, and I will tell you they're coming into our school systems. That is the mechanism the devil's using in our schools. And um, I could go on there, but all this drag queen story hour nonsense and all the stuff you're seeing, and you're saying it's not in our school, you're wrong. It is in your school. Cypress, Cy Fair, Klein, Harris County, all these schools right here, right in our area, have this stuff in them. And there's an agenda. Do we fight with flesh and blood? Who's our battle against? The devil, the dragon. But he is using this system to interject his... And that's why several months ago we said every day, every Sunday, we want to pray for these kids. We're, they're going into a school environment, many of them, that we did not go into. That is there today. But I thought the boldness of school board members to put at their board meetings, I'm a Wiccan, and to, and to br broadcast and be proud about it. And I looked up last night Cedar Hill. I went on YouTube. Uh, I, I, I think I just Googled Cedar Hill witchcraft. And, they, and it shows them, so, there's a reporter filming it, and they're out there howling at the moon and having some kind of seance. And they're saying, we need to keep this power in the schools. And these Christians that are coming against us, we need to block them. And we're putting a curse on them and a hex on them. And, and that's adults right here in Texas saying this stuff. And they're on the school board. That is real. So when we read these things, I want you, I, say, I tell you those stories not to shock you so much as to spur you to the seriousness of what's going on right in front of our eyes. It's easy for us on Sunday to come in here and, and yes, we do what, obviously we want to sing and praise the Lord, don't we? Amen? But we also want to be aware of the time we're in. And the days we live in are evil. And they are getting, anyone believe here things are getting better? Anyone in here think things are getting worse and worse? Do we need to worry? We need to plan. We need to be aware. Be anxious for nothing. And so we, as we move along here then in verse uh, 4, it says they began worshiping the dragon because he gave his authority to the beast. So there's the, the, there's the dragon, the devil. He raises up this human being, an antichrist, the antichrist. And the, the devil gives him power and authority over these kingdoms. Who, currently, who has power and authority over this world? Ultimately, we know it's Jesus, right? But who currently has the authority over this world? Satan does. And you remember when Jesus tempted Satan? He said, if you'll kneel down before me, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. Satan can give kingdoms of the world. He currently is over them. And there's going to be a person that he raises up and gives him a power and authority and tells this Antichrist, I'm going to give you the kingdom of the world and they will yield to you. And they will worship you and they will worship me through you because I'm giving you this a power. We see, when we, that when we get to these next few verses, the second part of chapter 13, what I envision here is Jesus Christ and John the Baptist. Because the next part of chapter 13 talks about the false prophet. And the false prophet points the world towards the Antichrist. What did John the Baptist do? He pointed him towards Jesus, the Christ. So let's keep going here. In verse 5, it says, There was given to him, uh, they're talking about the Antichrist, there was given to, not the dragon, but the beast, there was given to the beast power in his mouth, speaking arrogant words and blasphemies, and authority to act for 42 months was given him for three and a half years. This Antichrist will speak and act and do things with the power of Satan behind him. Verse 6 says, and he opened his mouth and blasphemies against God. I am glad that God is merciful 
and he's slow to anger. But you know, one day his anger will come to this earth. And you, each of us, have a choice. Do we want to be in God's grace, disciplined with grace, or punishment in anger? And I will tell you, the answer is always disciplined with God's grace. You never want to be punished by God's anger. And those are two radically different things. And it says, but at one point, this Antichrist will yield and kneel. You know, the scripture tells us every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. Until Christ comes back and enforces his role on this earth, the devil is going to be in power. And he gives us one power to blaspheme against God himself. And I know some of you might be saying, well, if God's good and God's powerful and he is, why does he allow this? And I've said this before when people ask me that question, theodicy, they try to prove there's no God because if God was all good and God was all powerful, wouldn't an all good, all powerful God stop sin in the world today? And I said, the day's coming when he will do that, but his mercy is waiting. Well, I think he should do it today. Okay, great. Do you want him to start with you? What do you mean me? You ever stole? You ever had a bad thought? You ever had a bad word? You ever said something, done something, took a piece of gum out of your mom's purse? You want to bring back judgment today for that? Well, no, I'm not a bad person. It's always God, I want God to fix the other person's problem, not mine. I'm glad God's merciful. I'm glad that before I accepted Christ as my Savior, His wrath was held from me. And He is long-suffering towards me prior to my accepting His grace. And if nothing else, we should all be thankful for that. Lord, thank you for giving me grace until my eyes were opened. For by grace are you saved through faith. It is a gift of God. Thank you for holding judgment until your Holy Spirit revealed to me who your son Jesus Christ was. So in verse 6 it says, He opened his mouth and blasphemed against God to blaspheme God's name. Mine says his tabernacle, you might say his dwelling place, and those who dwell in heaven. Who's going to dwell in heaven? I am of the opinion that by this time, most if not all of the saints are gone out of the world. And he's blaspheming God, heaven, and the people that dwell in heaven. You know, if you're a believer, do you know Satan hates you? And it's a hot hatred. It's not a mild hatred. It's not I don't get along with that person because they're a believer. It's I hate you. I want to destroy you. Can Satan touch your soul once you're a believer? Can he mess up your life, though? Can he take your joy of your salvation? I always tell people, he can't take your salvation. He can take the joy of your salvation. If you let them. If you let this stuff and you read the newspapers and you read the headlines and you start getting anxious and you start getting worried and you start getting upset, he will steal the joy of your salvation. And we're told over and over and over and over in the Bible, do not be afraid. Now I'm encouraging you these next few years as we move forward in time, you better cling to that. Be anxious for nothing. Do not be afraid. Prepare. Plan. Proclaim the gospel. Be busy about my father's business. But I'm not going to let Satan steal my joy. I'm not going to let Satan steal my kids or my grandkids. I'm not going to let Satan mess this area of my life up. Stand in the power that Jesus Christ has given you. Now, if you get complicit with the devil and you allow sin in and you accept sin in and you bring Satan in, can you expect problems? Absolutely. If you're obedient you follow God's word, you obey the Lord, I think God will give you, you will be part of the faithful remnant God will protect. He may not protect you physically. I've heard many times in my life, as long as you're God's will, you'll be fine. Satan can't touch you. Spiritually, he can't touch you. Do we believe there's martyrs in the world? Yeah. So whenever someone says, as long as you're in God's will, Satan can't harm you, that's not true. Was Job in God's will? There was a man in the land of us whose name was Job and he was righteous before God. And Satan went up to God and accused Job. Well, you're, he's only following you because you've blessed him. Take his blessings. He'll still, he'll still praise me. Satan can mess you up. You've got to know the, the, the enemy that you're fighting. And so there was given, uh, verse 7, it says it was given to him to make war with the saints. And if you don't believe that, look at verse 7. It says it was also given to him to make war with the saints. Are we the saints? We're the saints. It was given to him power to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Now, that's not something we're really getting standing up, amen, hallelujah, about, is it? That's kind of what he means he's going to overcome us. Basically, that means, remember way back in Revelation a few weeks ago, we said it said they saw an altar, and under the altar were martyrs crying out, How long, O Lord, 
till you avenge us. And we talked about that. I want to be clear if you weren't here. It wasn't until you revenge us. Their, their cry was not, God, we want you to cause them harm because they caused us harm. Their cry was, God, we want your will to be done in this area. Avenge us. God, do what is right. And God will do what is right on his timeline. Not on our timeline. Don't you wish God, well, don't you wish in your childishness that God did things on your timeline? But in your maturity, you realize, God, thanks for not doing things on my timeline. I thank you for being God and not letting me be God. Because some of us would ask for stuff he gave it to us would mess us up. I see everyone's here today, so I guess no one won the 1.9 billion last night or whatever it was, or 1.9 million or whatever the story was. But I hope if you were to win, I hope you'd be here the next Sunday. And bringing your tithe. <laughs> and verse 8 says, All who dwell... No, no, verse 7, He gave power of Him to make war with the saints, to overcome them, and authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to Him. So we know that this world power is not yet existing because not every nation in the world, not every tongue, not every ethnic group has yet yielded their authority to a single person. So we know that this is still in the future for us, but as you see the world and you see the world geopolitical situation, you say, I do see it lining up that way. Things are moving that direction. And it says, all who dwell on the earth will worship him, everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the Lamb's book of life has been, who has been slain. I think this little passage here was put in there. Could reading this alarm some Christians? Could it alarm some believers? But he gives us this little clause there that you can almost skip over. You read it and you're almost not really sure what he's saying. I think it's a word of encouragement to us. He will overcome everyone. He will overcome the saints. And all who dwell on the earth will worship him, everyone except those who are true believers. And your names weren't just written down the day you accepted the Lord, when does the book tell us it was written down? It says your name was written in the book before the foundation of the world were set. So do you have eternal hope from before the world was created till all through eternity till this world is no more that you're one of the followers of the Lamb, the true Lamb? And the answer is yes. Right here it gives us his encouragement. Everyone on the earth will worship him except for those whose names are written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who has been slain. You are sealed for all eternity when you accept Christ. And some of us, I've heard messages and stories and testimonies of people that say, I didn't get saved till I was 17 or 25 or 30, but after I became saved, I could look back and you know, before I came to Christ, I could see his hand in my life. I could see a person that came and told me something, a grandmother that prayed for me, someone that gave me a word of encouragement, a Christian that did something for me. I could see God's work in my life before I became a believer. And I think that is, I do believe that. I do believe God says, I know who will accept me. And prior to your coming to me, I will give protections to you. We're, we're sinful people, but if your wife or your friend or someone you know close is a pregnant, is that pregnant person before that baby's born, protect that child and take pills and medicines and go to the doctor and say, I want a safe, healthy baby? And the answer is yes. If we being sinful do that for physical children, how much more our Father in Heaven for His spiritual children? Then He says, I know on this date at this time, Faye's going to come to me in Christ. So Faye, before you ever came to me here, way back here, I was at work. I was planning and plotting and I had your days numbered and I knew the day. Do you believe that God knew the day that you came to Him and gave Him your life? I do. And I think prior to that day, he was working in your life. I've heard people say, man, I, I drove, I was so drunk, I don't even know how I got home, but somehow I got home safe. Lord, take, the Lord must have drove me home and got me so home. All those stories and all that sin, but they say, but God was with me even then. I, I didn't know it then, but I look back and I see it now. Maybe that's some of our testimonies in here. So uh, if anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is... Destined for captivity, in verse 10, to captivity he goes. If anyone kills with a sword, with a sword, he must also be killed. Here's the perseverance of the saints. When trouble comes, are you going to stand strong for the Lord? And the answer, what the word told us is yes. Some of you today might say, I don't know what's going to happen. If someone pointed a gun at me and said, are you a believer? What would I say? I believe this is that situation when that time comes, God will give you the strength and the faith to do what you need to do. And, and I say that based on many times as we've studied Abraham, 
I, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, Abraham. Remember when God told Abraham to slay your son? And then as he lifted up the uh, knife and Abraham told, you remember his son said, well, Dad, I see the fire and I see the wood, but where's the lamb? And Abraham said, the Lord himself will present and give a lamb. I don't know that Abraham knew what he said when he said it, but that was divine because God himself did one day offer his own lamb. But as he lifted up his hand with a knife in it and said he was about to strike his son Isaac, the son of promise, what happened? An angel said, stop. Now people say, well, why'd God put Abraham to that test if God knew what Abraham was going to do? Who do you think he was strengthening faith? Do you think God needed to know what Abraham would do or do you think God already knew what Abraham would do? I think God knew what Abraham would do. But did Abraham? Did Abraham know what he was going to do? He wasn't teaching himself something. God wasn't teaching himself something. He was teaching Abraham about faith. Saying, Abraham, because you would not even withhold your own son from me, I will bless, the, the nations of the world will be blessed through you. And then, of course, Jesus Christ came from, as we saw last week in chapter 12, the Jewish nation. The woman is Israel. And so anyway, so I would encourage you, you say, well, I don't know how, if my faith would be strong enough. Brother, sister in Christ, your faith will be strong enough to stand. I, if you're a true believer, I think God at that moment, if God wanted you to walk on water, could you walk on water? Yeah. I mean, we say these things, we know them, but we got to reinforce our minds because when we leave these doors today, do we go out into an evil world? And are there voices out there and thoughts and opinions that you start... Well, I know God said this, but this person with all these letters behind their name said this. I don't care how many letters they have behind their name. If you're with God, you are the majority. God and you are the majority in any situation, in any argument. Don't let the world, well, you're uneducated, you don't have degrees, you don't know science, I'm science, you're, you're not smart. Don't let the world tell you that nonsense. In any event, uh, so, so we talk about the Antichrist, and then it talks about this beast in these next few verses, and we'll finish up here quickly. He said, then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. It's, it's, he saw another beast coming up out of the land. Israel has an idiom of the land is Palestine, Israel. What we know is Israel today. Now, we don't know this, but if the first beast, the Antichrist, comes out of the Gentile nations, it would be very clever to have a false prophet come up out of Israel, wouldn't it? If you were in our Bible study today, we talked about Mark chapter 3, and it said the Pharisees sought to kill Jesus. Were the Pharisees Jews? You better believe they were. They were the premier Jews of their day. And this is just a speculation, but we saw one beast come out of the sea, one beast come out of the land. And this beast that comes out of the land very well could be someone of Jewish ancestry. And it said he had two horns like a lamb. Is, is this false beast going to come as with pitchfork and horns and looking evil. Every movie I ever see, I don't like those movies, Damien and Omien and Omen, whatever those shows are, but they always make the bad guy look bad. You know, the Antichrist looks scary. It says he's going to come as a little lamb. And it, the word also tells us some of the elect will even be fooled. I told you years ago I was asked to speak about who is Jesus in a mosque over here on Greens Road. And I was there and there was a guy sitting next to me and he was a ecumenical something or other. And he was saying, oh, yeah, you're a Christian. I 100% Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And he was buried and he rose again. And I, I'm just glad to tell who Jesus is to me. And I'm going to speak tonight. And you know, we were both speaking that evening. And he said, whatever. And I went up there and preached. I am uh, not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ for it's the power of God unto salvation. I preached out of Acts. He got up there and said to a room full of Muslims, folks, I'm a believer through Jesus Christ. And that's my way to heaven. But you all are getting through Allah. And other people get through through Buddha. And other people get through the Confucius. And Jesus was the God that was revealed to my culture, my background. But if you've got, if you've got God revealed a different way, that's your way to heaven. And, we're, and he said, I can't help but think that up in heaven, there's a cloud. And Jesus and Buddha and Confucius are all sitting there together. And they're looking down at the world saying, why can't we figure things out? Why are we at war? And we're not at war. We all serve the same God. You talk about blasphemy. I just sat there stunned and thinking, this is the guy that not a half hour ago was telling me Jesus Christ died for my sins, was buried, he rose again, I'm getting to heaven because of nothing in me but all what Jesus did. Doesn't that sound spot on? 
But the moment he thinks that Jesus is a way and not the way, he just called Jesus a liar. You can't say that you go to heaven through Buddha. And we do not all serve the same God. Allah is not the God revealed in the Bible. It is a demonic power of this world that's taking millions and millions and millions of people to hell. We're not fighting against Muslims. We're fighting for Muslims. We, wouldn't we, don't we want to win them to Christ? That's our goal. And so anyway, so this false beast, uh, this false prophet that comes out of the earth had two horns. It's going to come like a lamb, but what does it speak like? But speaks like a dragon. And I saw that guy, I can't ever, I'll probably never forget that guy that night thinking, boy, he sounded so much like light. I would have called him a brother in Christ up until I heard him speak. And then I instantly knew he's speaking like a dragon. Doesn't the devil say that? Does the devil say there's many ways to heaven? So, who's, so he looks like a, a little lamb there sitting next to me talking one-on-one. -on -one. Who was he in reality? He was speaking like a dragon. He was speaking like a devil. And it says he, exercise, he exercises all the authority of the first beast, verse 12, in his presence. And he makes the earth and those who dwell in it worship the first beast whose fatal wound was healed. He performs great signs so that even makes fire come down from the heavens of the, uh, in the earth in the presence of men. W wouldn't that be, if you had someone that could show up and say, watch this, I'm a man of God and I can call fire down. He calls fire and fire comes down to earth. Could people be deceived by that kind of power? You better believe they could be. Some of the elect kind of believe that. There's been people, I, I believe, that are brothers and sisters in Christ that think abortion is okay. And I'm like, I don't know how you can be a believer and think that's okay. Now, if that's you, if you want to talk to me one-on-one, -on -one, privately, no one knows, that's fine. Abortion is not God's plan. That's the devil's plan. And if you've got other things going on in the world that have seeped into your mind, we can sit down one-on-one. -on -one. No one has to know but you and me. We'll go through Scripture and we'll point out Satan comes to do what? Steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus says, but I have come that they may have life. Who's for murder? Who's for life? Very clear. That should be very clear in our minds. That's just one issue of many. God made them Adam and Eve, man and wife, and blessed that union. There is no other marriage union blessed by God but one biological male to one biological woman. That's the union that's blessed. And I'm sorry I have to say this if it's offending you. It's not my plan. And if, you know, if, I don't know if we're on video or not, but if you're at home and this offends you, I'm sorry. This is God's plan. And we've got to be very clear where we stand. But when Jesus says, I said earlier in John 14, be not troubled, you believe in God, believe also in me, let your, not your hearts be troubled. And he says, where I go, you know, my, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you but I'm going to come back and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. And he said, if you, if you go after me and follow me, and Thomas says, well, how, we don't know where you're going. How are we going to know the way? And what does Jesus say in John 14, 6? I am the definite article. I am the way. You could add, I am the way and the only way. Anyone that thinks there's multiple ways, I don't care if you're the biggest Oprah Winfrey fan in the world, when Oprah says, Jesus is my way, but there's other ways, she's, she may look like a lamb, she's speaking like a dragon. Because that's what the dragon says. We as people of the book, people of faith, people of Jesus Christ, we say Jesus is the way and the only way. Well, that's very narrow-minded. That's very exclusive. You're not being inclusive of everyone. Folks, the moment I hear people tell me that, I say, whoa, whoa, whoa. The Bible says it is God's will that everyone comes to faith through Jesus Christ. This is the most inclusive religion in the world. The dragon can twist our minds up and think it's exclusive. It's inclusive. Is God's will that everyone comes to saving grace through Jesus Christ? It, it, it's God's will that everyone comes to faith in Jesus Christ. It's inclusive. It's not exclusive. It's inclusive. But the devil gets you, oh, so if I don't go your way, I don't get to heaven. No, don't follow me. But if you don't go through Jesus, you don't go. That's, that's the one religion in the world given by God to men. Every other religion in the world is given by the dragon. There are many ways. No, there are not. 
didn't mean to go off on that tangent, but I wanted to get that said to affirm everyone. Not your opinions, but to affirm up your theology with biblical theology. So it says, He exercises authority, calls down fire from heaven. It was given to him to give breath to the image of the beast. So the image of the beast would even speak and cause as many to do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. So there's going to be some... And this is where some people think that this is uh, a, a, uh, an entity, like an organization, this false prophet. But just like the Antichrist, I think there's going to be a single person over the nations, de- built up by Satan and given power by Satan. I think there's going to be a one world religious leader that's over a religion. I, I would again encourage you to go study and go Google yourself for your own uh, information. A few years ago, you know the Pope, you know who the Pope invited to pray in the Vatican? An imam, a Muslim imam, went into the Vatican and prayed in the name of Allah. And I think if Catholicism and Islam joined together, boy, that would be a good setup for a one world religion. And they are definitely becoming friendly. Now, I'm, if you're Catholic, I'm not here to offend you either. If you're Muslim at home or watching, I'm not here to offend you. I'm just telling you, we know this is coming and we can start putting things together. Not that we're right, but we can speculate that's interesting that a Pope would invite a Muslim to come into the Vatican and pray to Allah. If he's a follower of Christ, I'll tell you this. I will never have someone in this building pray to Allah. Th- this is not a place for that. You want to play to Jesus Christ? We love to have you. You want to worship Jesus Christ? We love to have you. I don't care what you are, who you are, what your background is. If you come to worship Jesus Christ, we want you here. If you come for any other person, you don't come here. So, but this, this, uh, this uh, false prophet will point people towards the beast in verse 16, it says, It causes all, the small and the great, the rich and the poor, and the free men and the slaves to be given a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. And he provides that no one will be able to buy or sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. Will people do crazy things for money? So you can see that this false prophet and this false beast, this uh, beast, this antichrist, they're going to take control over basically what we would call currency. For years I've struggled with how in the world Dwight bought some eggs for me today. How in the world would somebody stop Dwight from giving me a couple dollars for the best eggs you've ever had in your life? (laughs) And you would say, how would they stop you from that? I'm telling you, does digital currency seem like a way to do that? You know, digital, there's no more money. No one has, everything's online, everything's digital. And I'm not saying that don't use Zelle or Zoom or... I don't even know all the names of them anymore. But I've had people that, if, that uh, owed money, and they're like, I can only do it electronically. I mean, what do you only mean electronically? I pay all my bills electronically. I said, well, don't you have cash? I've talked to them because I haven't, I haven't had cash in months. I said, what do you do for money? I use my little card for my Starbucks and my McDonald's and my Amazon deliveries, and I don't use cash anymore. That, I find that very odd. No one else does? No, I'm not saying if you use your little card, I'm not saying that's demonic. I'm just saying the world is moving that direction. But in any event, so it says no one will be able to buy or sell anything. Start your gardens. It doesn't say no one can grow their own food. No one will be able to buy or sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast for the number is that of the number of a man, 666. And that 666 is, when, you know, it's man's number. It's not perfection. The number seven is perfection. Man is made a little lower than the angels. We're not perfect. But when man basically says, and this really, this not obeying God's word, when did not obeying God's word begin? The Garden of Eden. Dwight, it was that Dwight or whoever said that. Not obeying God's word started in the Garden of Eden. Adam, Eve, do not eat of that tree. God will do what we want. We'll do it our way. That, I think, I don't know, there's a literally 666 going to be here, maybe on your forehead. Maybe it is, I don't know. But basically, I would tell you the the goal of I will do things my way, I will do things man's way, that tells me a lot when people say, I know what the Bible says, but I don't care what the Bible says, I'll do things my way. That kind of tells you who's leading them. And I I close with this next week in chapter 14, verse 1, just to show you how the devil's a copycat, but always for the evil. 
Verse 14, uh, verse, chapter 14, verse 1 says, Then I looked, and behold, the Lamb, the true Lamb, was standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his name and his name of his Father written on their foreheads. So God's going to put a mark on his elect. Satan's going to put a mark on his followers also. But it is not the mark you want. Folks, I know that was a little uh, difficult maybe today to go through. Revelation 13 is difficult to preach. There's things in there that we don't talk about often. There's a lot of speculation. There's a lot of stuff in that chapter that's not very clear. So, But uh, I will tell you, for the world's system, the world's economy, the world's whatever, things will be getting worse in the days ahead. Do we have any reason to fear at all? No. Should we be planning? Should we be busy about proclaiming the gospel? Do we believe that our days are numbered, our days are short? Do you believe you live in an evil, dark age, and the time will come when no one can work? It'll be dark. Next week we'll look at chapter 14 more, where the angel is given the proclamation. I think by that time, uh, the, world, the, the church will be out of the world. Millennialist, pre-trib, pre-rapture like myself. Or if you're a, a mid-trib or a post-trib, and some people don't even believe in the... Uh, uh, rapture of the church. I'm pretty confident it will happen. And partly because I've told Danny a lot, I hope it happens because I want to believe it happens. I don't want to be here for this. But uh, we do realize it's going to happen. So keep your heads up. Keep praising the Lord. We have nothing to worry about. We'll pick up chapter 14 next week. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this message today. We thank you for giving us wisdom. As your word just said, if anyone has wisdom, let them hear these words and, and study and focus. And Father, we also thank you for back early in Revelation. It says, blessed are those that read these words and hear these words of yours. They don't, it's not easy for us to understand, Father. Forgive us where we fail you, where our understanding is shadowed or darkened. Uh, maybe that's by your design that we don't know all these facts. You don't tell us clearly, but you do give us information. Uh, Father, we do know that Jesus Christ wants everyone to come to salvation. He died on the cross for our sins. Father, help that all men would come to him. Help Autumn Creek and the members of Autumn Creek to lift him up. As the word says, if I am lifted up, all nations will come to me. Help us, fathers. We know we have an adversary, the devil. We have an accuser of the brethren. Father, we condemn him in the name of Jesus. We ask him to leave this church alone. Leave the people of this church alone. Help him not steal the joy of our salvation. Help us to leave here today uh, looking forward to the holidays coming up, the Thanksgiving, of course, Christmas, the birth of your son when you sent him into this world to die for our sins. Father, we ask all this in your name. Amen.